I want to talk to you this morning about the power of our words. The power of our words, because as Christians, it's very important the way we talk, both individually and collectively. Because Proverbs 18.21, it says that the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. Let's read that again a little bit, slow down. The tongue, the way we talk, has the power of life and death. And those who love it, love what? Love our tongues, they will eat from its fruit. What does that last part mean? Those who love the tongue, those who love it will eat of its fruit, will benefit of its fruit. It means those who value the way they talk, who watch their words and season their words with wisdom, those who honor the way they talk, those who, who appreciate the ability to talk, those are the people who are going to benefit from the way they talk at home and at work and in school and in our country and in our communities and in our churches and with our classmates and with our co-workers because they will see their words as a way to build their lives and benefit their lives which means they might talk a little slower they might think a little more they might value not just what they're saying but the way they're saying something because they see the way they talk as a way to benefit themselves and a way to benefit their lives. They won't just be shooting off their mouths, giving someone a piece of their mind every two seconds. Nope, they're going to look at life with a long-range lens, not nearsighted vision. And they're going to see that how they say things and what they say is either going to benefit them or it's going to hurt them. It's either going to help them or it's going to hurt them. And they're going to value the way they talk and benefit from the way they talk because they're going to see that, hey, the way I talk, this could build my life. This could benefit my life. And that begins with understanding that the tongue, the way we talk, has the power of life and death. And that is certainly true. It is certainly true to say that the tongue has the power of life and death because God spoke life into existence in Genesis chapter 1 when he said, let there be light. He said, let there be light. And there was light. And the basis for all of life was spoken into being by God. And then the tongue has the power of death is also true in Jesus' words in the gospel, Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus says, we murder with our mouths when we speak reka to our brothers and sisters, when we call them a stupid fool is the equivalent in English. The church has the power of life and death in our tongue, the way we talk. Individual Christians do too, and the responsibility for bringing more positive, encouraging words is not just the responsibility of Caleb, it's the responsibility of every Christian. Amen? Amen? It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for the building up of others, according to their needs, that it may benefit those who hear it. You know, it is so easy to grumble and complain and tear other people down and talk about ourselves, either self-aggrandizing or going through the, oh, woe is me thing, just, just narcissistically focusing on ourselves so much and everything. But that's not how God wants us to, to use our mouths. God doesn't want us to use our mouths to tear other people down. God doesn't want us to use our mouths to grumble and complain. God doesn't want us to use our mouths to overtly talk about ourselves. God wants us to use our mouths, according to Ephesians 4.29, He wants us to use our mouths for the building up of other people. That can only happen with intent and on purpose. Doing it intentionally and purposely, building them up according to what they need. Not according to what we need, but according to what they need. So it may benefit those who are hearing what we say. There are people around us every day. You work with them. Some of you live with them. Some of you in a few weeks will go to school with them who need to hear positive and encouraging words, optimistic words, hopeful words, not hopeless words, optimistic words, not negative words. There's enough negativity where you work. There's enough negativity in our homes. There's enough negativity in our schools. There's enough negativity in our communities, and there's enough negativity in our country, and it is up to the Christians 
to stand up and speak up words of positivity and hope and help and healing and optimism in people's lives. And God is calling us to do that, church. Who are we going to wait for? Don't wait for the person next to you. Let it begin with you. Let it start with you. Take ownership of this scripture. Say, God, this is going to be my scripture. I'm going to do this, Lord, because you're telling me to do this. Where there is anger, I'm going to sow love. Where there is hate, I'm going to, to sow uh, forgiveness. Where there is discord and division, I'm going to sow unity and harmony, Lord Jesus. And I'm going to give it all I have, Father, because you're calling me to do that. For I am a Christian, and there are power. There is power in my words. Colossians 4, 6, it continues the thought where it says, Let your conversation always be full of grace. Season with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. In other words, so you may know how to speak to people, how to speak to everyone. Now, I want you to focus on the screen, on the phrase, season with salt. Because salt is a purifier, it's a preservative, and it makes things taste better. You know, I think corn tastes a little sweeter when you put a little salt on it. I think meat tastes a little better when you put a little salt on it. Let your conversation be seasoned with salt as a purifier and a preservative. That means, as Christians, our conversations with people should bring purity into that relationship, not unwholesomeness, but purity, and should bring preservation into their lives and into the relationship. We shouldn't damage people or destroy people by the way we talk. We should speak life into them. We should speak hope, help, and healing into them. We should speak that which is pure and that which will preserve and promote healthiness and hopefulness in their lives and healthiness in our relationships. And to do that, we need wisdom in our words, don't we? We need to watch the way we speak. We need wisdom in our words. And Ironically, having wisdom in our words starts with being able to listen more and sometimes speak less. Being quicker to listen and slow to speak. That's what it says in James 1, verse 19. But oftentimes, people get that order in reverse. Instead of being quick to listen and slow to speak, lots of people are quick to speak and slow to listen. We'll interrupt each other. We're imp we'll impulsively talk over each other. We won't wait for each other to finish their sentences. We will assume that we know what they're going to say. And so we will just talk over them and talk on their words. And, and all of a sudden, we're impulsively speaking, 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 speaking. And they're trying to get their words out. And you're trying to get your words out. And all of a sudden, nobody's listening to each other anymore. Because we're not quick to listen, slow to speak. We become quick to speak and slow to listen. You know, Proverbs chapter 12, it says, A fool blurts out their folly. But a wise person knows how to hold their tongue. You know, when I think of a, a blurting fool, not a fool so much, but when I think of somebody who just has to blurt out things that they think in, in scriptures, I honestly go to impulsive Peter every time. I love Peter. I truly do. We learn so much from Peter. I learn so much from Peter. I can't wait to meet him one day in heaven. But Peter would be the first one to tell you, that in the Gospels, he was very much impulsive Peter. He was always blurting out. And sometimes he got it right, and sometimes he got it wrong. I remember one time in Matthew chapter 16 where he got it both right and both wrong in the same conversation with Jesus. Jesus asked all of his apostles, he said, who do people say that I am? And they came up with various answers that they had heard people say. Some think you're Elijah, the prophet, come back again and everything. And Jesus looked at them and said, but well, who do you say that I am? And all of a sudden Peter went, oh, 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 I know, I know, I know. And Jesus said, yes, Peter. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said, that's right, Peter. But you didn't come to this conclusion on your own. It was the Holy Spirit who revealed it to you. Peter's like, yeah, yeah, but I got it right. I got it right. And so a little while later in the conversation, though, here comes the, the turn. Same conversation a little while later. Jesus is explaining to his disciples how he will go to Jerusalem 
and he will be handed over to the chief priests, and they will hand him over to Pilate, and he will die and everything, be crucified in Jerusalem and stuff. And all of a sudden, Impulsive Peter gets another thought in his head that he just can't hold it back. And so he goes, oh, 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 I will never let that happen to you, Lord. I will never let you go to Jerusalem and die. I will die to defend you. I will never let it happen, Lord. And what did Jesus say to Peter then? Get thee behind me, say. Can you imagine anybody else who would want to crawl into their sandals if they could to get out of there? Peter's probably thinking, man, 10 minutes ago I had it so right, and now I have it so wrong, and I don't understand. Jesus said, Peter, you don't have the things of God in mind in your impulsivity, if that's even a word, in your impulsiveness, but you have the things of humans. You've got human logic, human reasonings, human impulsiveness going on right now. You see, many times we take unconscious things for granted in our lives, like breathing and our heart beating. We never think about our heart beating until it stops or until it's irregular. We never think about breathing. We just do it unconsciously. We take it for granted. I think the same is true with the way we talk and our speech. Many times we think of our ability to speak as a right. I have a freedom of speech, and yes, you do. But slow down there for a second, Sonny, because the way you use your mouth can either help you or hurt you. Because there's always consequences when we use our freedom of speech. And let me be very clear, I love our freedom of speech in this nation. We have the freedom of speech in this nation. We should applaud and value our freedom of speech. But in valuing that, we should watch the way we say things. We should watch our words because they have the power of life and death. And maybe if we looked at our freedoms and our abilities to speak as more of a blessing from God than an inherent right, maybe we would be more careful with how we talked. I think of another guy named Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, who kind of like uh, Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament, the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah and to Elizabeth and said, by the way, you guys are going to have a baby. Apparently they were having a hard time having a baby too. And so the angel Gabriel said, you guys are going to have a baby, and you're going to name him John. He's going to grow up to be a Baptist. Thank you very much. Okay. And Zechariah, apparently, it wasn't just bewilderment, but it was a literal lack of believing that God was going to do this. That Gabriel looked at him and said, because you don't believe God's going to do this, you're not going to be allowed to talk for nine months until you see your wife give birth to God's promise that he made to you today. And for nine months, Zechariah couldn't talk. And all the wives and mothers said, yay and amen. <laughs> but can you imagine not being able to talk because of your lack of faith in God? Can you imagine not being able to talk because, like Nebuchadnezzar, the way you talked about God with disparaging words and things like that? Maybe... If we looked at our ability to talk, like I'm doing now, as a blessing from God and not just an inherent right of freedom of speech, maybe we would use our tongues more wisely, more carefully. We would say words that build other people up and don't tear anybody down. Amen? And when we do speak, then what if we spoke words of blessing on other people's lives? What if we used our words to speak blessings on other people's lives? You know, children are wise to learn from and obey their parents. Absolutely, because the parents, we've been there and done that, and it's right and wise for a, for a child as they're growing up to say, Mommy, Daddy, how do you do something? How do you do this? How did you do that? How did you, when you were my age, how did you cope with this, that, and the other thing? That's perfectly wise and good for children to do. But I'm also reminded of the flip side of the coin in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, where it says, Don't exasperate your children. And lots of times people will ask me in parenting stuff, whatever, they'll say, well, what does it really mean to exasperate your child? And for our purposes here this morning, I would like to define exasperation as when the parent falls into the, the trap of always trying to fix their child rather than love their child. I remember seeing that in, in a video one time, not that long ago, actually, where the mother said that she realized after a while she was spending all of her time trying to fix her child rather than just love and enjoy her child. And I think to myself, that's such an easy trap for parents to fall into. 
Now, children, because they're young and they make mistakes, of course, there's things that need to be fixed every now and then and stuff. But it's so important that a child grows up to know that they're loved and they're accepted by their parents and they're not just a project of their parents. Trying to spend 20 years trying to craft the best person that I can, running around behind them, nagging them, fixing every little mistake that they make. And sometimes, I, I, I agree with you, if you're like this, I'm like this sometimes, sometimes it's very hard not to do that. The bigger stuff, you definitely want to make corrections on and everything, but you got to be willing to let kids make mistakes too. And as a parent, it's too easy to fall into the trap of we're always trying to fix them and get them perfect and everything, rather than making sure they know that they're loved and that they're accepted and that they're blessed by us. Do you know what speaking words of blessing into a child or into somebody else does? It sets up their future. It says, I believe in you and so does God. And I believe this is what God wants to do in you, for you, through you, and to you. God has plans and purposes to prosper you and to help you. You've got a bright and glorious future tomorrow because of who you are today and who our God is today. That will work in any child's life and that will work in anybody's life, frankly, because all of a sudden they have a sense of confidence because someone believes in them when they're insecure and they don't believe in themselves. It's like a football coach or a, 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 a loving dad who will instill confidence in them and not let them quit and not let them give up but will say to them over and over and over again, you can do this. You can do I remember when I was playing football, and, and some of my coaches early on were so instrumental in building up my confidence because they would say, Rory, you've got the right instincts. Quit second-guessing yourself. Pin your ears back and just go hit that guy. And I would pin my ears back, metaphorically, not literally. I don't believe in ear piercing for men. I'm just kidding. I don't care if you have them pierced or not. But I'm a wimp and I don't want to get my ears pierced, okay? But I would metaphorically pin my ears back and I would just hit the guy. I'd blitz, I'd do whatever. And it was, it was a couple coaches in my life who would simply not let me quit, not let me give up, who kept metaphorically kicking me in the rear end every now and then and saying, get in there, you can do this. You know what to do, just do it. They believed in me before I believed in myself. My dad was that way too. And Karen and I, we try and be that way with our kids. Now, no kids are perfect. Our kids are close. No, I'm kidding. No kids are perfect. Our kids aren't perfect either. But we're their biggest cheerleaders. We're their coach who loves them and needs And one of the things they need to know is how much we do love them and how much courage and confidence we have in them and in their abilities and in our God to bless them because he's got plans and purposes for them for a bright and glorious future. And we're the ones that articulates them into their lives. And so are you into your children's lives and in your grandchildren's lives. And they need it, especially when they don't feel it. How can you speak words of blessing into the lives of people around you this week? And then after that, how can we start speaking words of life and victory into our own lives? How can we start speaking words of life and victory into our own lives? Jesus said in Mark chapter uh, 11, Whoever says to this mountain, which would be a problem, be removed to the sea, which means get it out of the way, and that person does not doubt but believes that it will happen, then it will be granted to him. Whoever says to this problem, get out of my way, and I believe it's going to happen in Jesus' name, Jesus says it will happen. Christians who will not give up on God will be led to victory in God, in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that, church? Church. 